All right. If you will, turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of 1 Peter as we continue our study through the Word. So we have this amazing letter from the Apostle Peter to us, and he's exhorting us in our Christian faith. You will remember that in the last chapter, he was really talking about authority, the authority of God, and how our God is a God that does things decently and in order. You will remember that he first told us that we are to be in submission to the authority of government. Government is an institution that God created. Government's purpose is to organize uh, society so that we can live in safety and that we can live in cooperation with one another. And so he tells us that as citizens that we have an obligation to be law abiding and to respect the authority that government has. God has given that authority to government. Secondly, he says that in the workplace that we are to be respecters of the authority of our employers. When you work in a corporation, everybody has a boss. Everybody has somebody that they report to. And so there is an authority over our lives in the workplace. We are to be respectful of that authority that God has established. We are to be model employees. Can you imagine having a boss and you yell at your boss and you throw tantrums and you slam the door and you walk out on him? And how long would you stay employed in, uh, in that type of uh, environment? And, and so we see that in the workplace, we have an authority that is over us. We are to co-labor together for a mutually agreed upon goal and understand the line of authority. If the boss, after our input, our suggestions, our ideas, decides that this is the direction that we are going to go, then we are to submit to the leadership of the person that is in that place of authority, and that is the direction. The boss might turn right back around and say, no, we're heading in the exact opposite direction. And then we turn around and we head in that direction. Every team, every group of people that's organized together has to have a leader in order to be able to pursue the mutually agreed upon goals. And so there needs to be cooperation. There needs to be communication. But there needs to be leadership. There needs to be leadership in government. There needs to be leadership in the workplace. And so here we see that Peter is telling us that God wants us to be subject to leaders and to be respectful and to honor our leaders. As we move into this in third chapter, we're going to see that Peter is now going to bring it down to marriages and into the relationship that God has established within the marriage covenant. I want you to know that this is a difficult passage for women. So women, I want to encourage you today to open up your hearts to what the Word of God has to say. I want you to know that never has there been such a difficult time for God's Word. Not just this passage, but God's Word. I want you to know that there is an organized attack of the world upon the Word of God. God is the one that has ordered and organized the entire world. He has ordered our lives and given us a blueprint and has set that before us. And we see that the world is taking and denigrating that blueprint and trying to supplant it with its own blueprint. And so we see the attack upon the blueprint of God, not just in the passage that we're going to look at, but throughout the the scriptures. We see that our culture has moved to a place where it is so hostile against the blueprint that God has offered. The blueprint that God has offered has never changed. It has been his blueprint. The world's blueprint continues to change. It continues to, to morph and to shift. God's values, God's morals has never changed. He is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and 
and forever. And so when we look at the blueprint of God, uh, we have to understand and recognize that we are looking at the unchanging blueprints of God. God has a blueprint, and he offers them to us, and then he gives us free will. And this is what he says. You can, by faith, take and build your life upon the blueprint that I have set forth. I created the universe. I created the laws, uh, the natural laws, the spiritual laws, and uh, this is the way in which you will be the most blessed. And we can, by faith, take those blueprints. We can build them in our life and God will bless us and we will experience the blessings of God. Or we can believe that there is a modification that needs to happen to God's blueprints and we can take some of God's blueprints and then we can alter them to what's comfortable for us and then we have a a partial obedience to God's blessings. Well, partial obedience to God is going to equal a partial blessing. You are the one that's going to miss out on the fullness of what God had if you would have conducted your life according to the word of God. The attack of the world upon the blueprint uh, uh, of God's plan for our life, we see it now has gone all the way down to the very beginning. In the beginning, God created them male and female, and he created them. Today, we see the attack of our culture is even on the gender, that male and female no longer needs to be established by physical limitations, but now we have gender identity, and however you feel that you want want to be. Our culture is telling the the men that they need to feminize, telling the women that you need to be masculine. We have women that are trying to play football and men's sports. We have men that are now trying to play women's sports because they identify and we see that there is a massive confusion just in the simplicity of gender itself. We see the issue of marriage. God established the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. We see the world is trying to redefine that. We see that God said that birth, uh, that the creation of a soul is that inception, that he knits together babies in, in the mother's womb. We see that the world says that it's your body and you can do whatever you want and with it and that life doesn't begin until after birth. And so we see that these are these major places in which the, the word of God and the blueprint for God's plan is being directly challenged by the uh, the world in which we live in. We see that the, the, the Bible tells us that marriage is a covenant between a man and a woman. We see that the world says, no, we will redefine marriage and, and we will now pour our own definitions into it. So the blueprint that God has we see is being challenged today in every single area by the world. The world is trying to improve God's plan for life and telling us that if we would listen to the world, that you will have a richer, happier, and better life. The reality is that God knows best. Amen? So I want you to say that with me. Ready? God knows best. That's the bottom line. We can either listen to the world and to the blueprint that they are handing to us, or we have the unchanging blueprint of God that he says that you can taste and see that I am good. Build your life on this. I will exalt you, and I will bless you. And so here as we come to this passage of marriage now, how is a marriage supposed to operate? Well, let's recognize an understand that God's the author of marriage. Amen? That marriage is not a civil union. It's not a civil contract. It's it's not an agreement between two people to join forces together to establish a a stable base and to achieve mutually agreed upon goals. That, That is not what marriage is about. I want you to know that marriage is a covenant that it is a holy and sacred institution that God created. It is between one man and one woman, and it is now to be a conjoining together to experience a oneness that is a mystery that the scriptures talk about. It is the imperfect triunity 
uh, of man, the body, the soul, and the spirit. You were formed and fashioned into a trinity. Body and soul were alive, and then when you became a believer, your spirit was now born again, was made alive, and, and now you were birthed into new life. In marriage, you are to join together and not be unequally yoked. An unequally yoked person can be joined physically in the body. They can be joined together in soul, in friendship, but they cannot be joined together spiritually. And so they are only two-thirds connected to what God established and created the covenant of marriage and to enjoy. We have two non-believers getting together. They now can only be joined in two-thirds of the trinity that God established and created for us to enjoy, which is the covenant of marriage. When I went to school, two-thirds was a 66%. If I got a 66% on a test, that was an F. Uh, that was a mm, failure. And so God doesn't want us to just enjoy 66% of our blessings, but he wants us to enter into the fullness that he created. This is why he says to you not to be unequally yoked because you will not enter into the covenant of marriage of what he created and established. The covenant of marriage is on this earth a typology. It is the closest thing that we will experience to the unity that we will have with God in heaven. In heaven, we will be joined together with God. There will be a perfect oneness. There will be a perfect intimacy. There will be transparency and honesty and communication. We're going to know him as we are known by him. And so we are going to enter into this glorious existence of perfect connection to our perfect God. Here upon this earth, we get to experience that as he molds us and fits us together to experience a oneness that is found only within the covenant of marriage. And so God established marriage as an institution for this earth, and it is a covenant. We take vows before God to enter into the holy matrimony that we see that God has ordained organized and ordained. God has not only created the institution of marriage, but he's ordered the institution of marriage. Now, I want you to know in government that the worst possible form of government that you can have is a committee of two. This is the worst of form of government that you can possibly have. If you're going to have a committee, it always needs to be in odd numbers. And the reason for that is that you always have a tiebreaker vote uh, so that the committee can move forwards and make decisions. If you have a committee of two people with equal power and they disagree, that's the end of it. Then it's stalemated on every single issue. If you have a husband and wife uh, who are a committee of two with equal voting power, then when he thinks that you should do it this way and she thinks that you should do it this way, then that's where it ends. And now you would be stuck on every single different turn in the road. I think we should do it this way. I think we should do it this way. And nothing happens. Well, let's go on to the next one. I think this. I think this. Okay, then, we're not going to do anything there either. And it would be the most frustrating of all relationships that you could possibly have. God said, I'm going to spare you from that. I'm going to allow this team of two, this committee of two that has been forged together in your marriage covenant to be able to keep on moving and not get stuck at every single hurdle. Therefore, I am going to select a leader of the committee of two. That leader is going to have the tiebreaker vote so that the committee doesn't get stuck on every single different decision. Anytime you have a group of people, small or large, there needs to be leadership. A country, a government needs a leadership. At work, a boss, employees need leadership. There needs to be someone who is making the decisions and organizing the efforts of the team. It is also true within a marriage as well. And so there needs to be 
a leader. God says, I have selected the leader for you. The man is going to be the leader. He is going to have the the tiebreaker vote. Ladies, I am going to make you to be the support. You're going to be the co-pilot. He's going to be the pilot. You're going to be the co-pilot. It is your job to work together collectively to make sure that you are accomplishing the objective now of getting this plane up and getting it back down again. Ultimately, the decision and the responsibility of what happens inside uh, of that cockpit is going to land on the shoulders of the pilot. The co-pilot's responsibility is to communicate, to give information, to help in every single way possible to be able to assist the pilot now with the co-pilot's effort to be able to accomplish the objective. It is not that there is a tyranny that is taking place. The co-pilot is not a slave to the pilot now. They are mutually respectful. They are qualified and they are working together in conjunction with someone having the authority to make final decision who also ends up with accountability for the decisions that are made. It is ultimately the pilot. If anything goes wrong and any decisions are made, he is the one that will now be brought before the trial and be held responsible for the actions and the decisions that were made within that cockpit. So also, God says, the leader is the one that is responsible to stand before me and to give an account for the decisions and for the direction that the marriage and the family went. And so we see that God has designated a leader and he has also designated now the support. As we move into this third chapter, we're going to see that God is now going to set forth through Peter, once again, affirming the wife's role within the covenant of marriage. And so we are going to see that both have equal value before God. We see throughout the scriptures that that ethnicity, that class, that wealth, that gender make absolutely no difference before God. We all stand equal before God. We're of equal value before before God, and we are equally loved before God. The roles and the callings that God gives to each of us are different, and we are to fulfill our calling before God and whatever he has called us to. When you get married, you enter into the ministry, and that is the ministry of marriage. And so you are called to build your marriage according to the blueprint that God has set forth. God promises that if you will build your marriage according to the blueprint that he established, that he will bless your marriage and that he will exalt your marriage to the degree that you will build it according to God's plan. So let's take a look at what God's plan is for a biblical marriage. He says in verse 1, chapter 3, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. The word submissive, I think, has a negative connotation. I think that we could replace that with yield to the leadership of your husband. Wives, yield to the leadership of your husband. God has established the man to be the leader. I want you to know that men, we didn't appoint ourselves to be leaders. God is the one who has thrust that responsibility upon our shoulders. It goes all the way back to the garden, back to the curse when Adam and Eve are being set out of the garden. You'll remember that God says to Eve that you have a desire to rule over your husbands. There is a in Innate, uh, it, it, there is something innate in a woman that desires to organize and to control and to, and to direct. And we see that as men, many of us would be happy to just let that happen. <laughs> just, you want to do it, go ahead. And, and we would yield to that. Women want it. We don't feel like fighting. So uh, there you go. But that is not the biblical plan that God has. God has said that the woman is to yield to the leadership of the man. I find so often our culture is trying to redefine that relationship, that that we are to divide our abilities uh, and responsibilities and roles according to our own talents and judgments. But we see that God is the one that has established the roles, and then he will equip us to the roles that he has called us to. So, 
Ladies, rather than trying to fight for control of the relationship, we see that God's plan is that you would help your husbands to be godly leaders rather than trying to control the outcome. And so here he says that women are to be supportive, yielded to the leadership of the husbands. We're going to see that Peter's going to talk to the husbands also as well. We see that there is nothing slavish in the marriage relationship. There is nothing slavish in the relationship between a pilot and a co-pilot. There is just simply a cooperative effort to, with a line of authority. It is the very same thing that is to happen within the marriage uh, entity. Now, we also see that within a marriage, there is to be a mutual submission of servanthood to one another. And we're going to see where God calls the husband now to also honor his wife. So we see yield to the authority, to the leadership of the husband. He says that even if some do not obey the word. So believer to believer, you are to submit to your husband. What about when a woman is married to a non-believer? Now we have an ungodly head that she finds herself married to. Does she still need to yield to submit to the authority of that ungodly person? Well, God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. God does not change just because the circumstances may be difficult or hard. The answer is yes, absolutely. That is the marriage covenant. And if she's a believer, she needs to be submitted to the biblical principles within her marriage. So whether you have a godly husband or you have an ungodly husband, the principle of line of authority still continues to operate. Now, we don't see the same instruction given to the husband. Why is that? Well, because normally what would happen with a, a, with a man when he gets saved in, in first century is that he would just take his whole family and bring them to church. He, as the head of the household, would just force them to come to church and that would end the situation. The wife, she doesn't have the authority to make her husband and children all come to church. And so two questions here. How does the wife win her husband to the Lord? And then secondly, does she have to stay submitted to his authority? She needs to stay submitted to the husband's authority as long as he is not asking her to do anything that is immoral. If he is going to lead them into an immoral direction, then her conscience before the Lord and the word of God tells her that she is to obey God rather than man and so we see the principle. Outside of immoral activity, she is to be submitted under his authority. How can she bring her husband to the Lord? I know that when you have an unbelieving spouse that you desire with all of your heart to get that person saved, and you want to tell them about Jesus. You want to talk about salvation. You want to talk about heaven. You want to talk about sin. You want to talk about the blessings of following after Jesus. You want to mm, put Bibles and leave them there with passages that are open and little books start getting put everywhere and, and even the, he's in the restroom and he pulls the toilet paper and a track falls out, you know, on, uh, on the ground. It's like every little way that you can get them to, uh, to hear about in Jesus. But, but what does Peter say that God's plan is for a wife married uh, to a non-believer? He says, let him read the epistle of your heart. Let him read the epistle of your heart. You don't win them with the words. You win them with your heart. Let him experience the change in you. Let him watch. A husband and a wife, they know each other like the back of their hand. They are sensitive to one another's changes, to, uh, to the appetites that will change, to the seasons in life that will change. They, they know the routines and the heart, and, uh, and they know each other intimately. 
When a person is being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, when they suddenly start to become more loving, when they are now nurturing, when they are gentle, when no longer do they shout in anger, no longer do they flip their hair back and walk out and give the cold shoulder, when, uh, when all of these actions of the flesh start to decrease in their life, when suddenly now there is kindness and support, in friendship, in gentleness. When the love of God starts to change a, a heart, it cannot help but start to be made manifest in the life. And that person that knows them so intimately is the first one that is reading the epistle of their heart and is noticing the changes. And as their life continues to be impacted by the change that is going on in that other person, they will begin to wonder what is the source of this change. And they will become curious as to that. Here we see that Peter says that without a word, without a word, they will see the epistle of God written upon your heart. And, and it says that, that you will win them by the conduct, by your conduct. Verse 2, it says, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, the fear of the Lord that now has you to be ministering to that other person. In verse 3, he talks about beauty. He's going to talk about the difference between corruptible beauty and incorruptible beauty. He's going to talk about outward beauty, and he's going to talk about inward beauty, and he's going to contrast the, the two of those together. He says, do not let your adornment be merely outward. If you're a note taker, I want you to circle merely. Merely is the key word in this verse. Do not let it be merely. Is he saying that you shouldn't take good care uh, of your external? Absolutely not. He says merely, meaning not exclusively. Do not let your care of your outside be the only beauty that you are concerned with. Is he saying that it's wrong to arrange your hair or wear jewelry or, or put on something nice? Absolutely not. We have a stewardship over our bodies. We are to be presentable. We are to have good hygiene. We're to brush our teeth. We're to <laughs> fix our hair. We're to make ourselves uh, as attractive as, uh, as we can. And so there is a stewardship to our beauty. But he says... Don't become obsessed with that. Don't become consumed with that. Don't let that be the only beauty that you are concerned with. What about your inward beauty? He says, rather, or in addition, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. So God has given to every single one of us a, a degree of beauty, of attractiveness. And, and what happens is, is that in our lives, we start off as a bud, and then we open up to a flower, and we reach the fullness of the flower's bloom. <laughs> and then we start to fade. <laughs> And then we start to wither. <laughs> and then we start to uh, fade away. And that, and that is the bloom of every flower that opens up into its crescendo, into its highest moment, and then, uh, and then it withers away. And God has given to every single one of us this, this flower of youth, and it bursts into forth. And, and then all of a sudden we find ourselves starting to wither. Is anybody withering? Is anybody experiencing now the, the fading of that zenith of beauty that, uh, that we used to have? And so here's what I, I want you to know, that the beauty that you were given in your life was only borrowed to you. You only were allowed to use it for a season, and, and then you have to give it back, <laughs> Wrinkle by wrinkle, and gray hair by gray hair, you, you slowly surrender it back to God, and, and graciously you received it, but also graciously you have to let it go again. It is incorruptible beauty. It is just on loan to you for a season. Job said uh, that the Lord giveth, <laughs> 
and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, that's not what the cosmetic industry would tell you. They say, fight for every wrinkle, get an injection, do this, do that. Hold on to that bloom. You can keep the flower of your youth forever. And, and there are so many people that are fighting against uh, surrendering back to the Lord the beauty that he gave it to you uh, for the season that you were allowed uh, to enjoy it. And so he says, but rather now, rather than the external, uh, which blossoms uh, into its zenith uh, and then deteriorates uh, and withers, he says, in contrast to that is the soul. He says, and, and the soul is a flower that starts to blossom and continues to blossom and continues to grow and continues to grow in your entire life. Your soul just continues to become more and more beautiful all the way into its zenith when you get taken into the presence uh, of God. So he says, one is a bell curve where you will hit it, your zenith, but then you will surrender it back to the Lord. But the other one, the other one continues to grow. And as you are surrendering your beauty back to the Lord, your corruptible beauty back to the Lord, know that you are exchanging it for the incorruptible beauty that will never end. And so that is what helps us to be able to surrender now the, uh, the corruptible beauty that God has given to everybody in a measure to be able to enjoy in this life. And so he says that that gentle and quiet spirit, that beautiful soul is precious in the sight of God. God does not care as much about the hairstyle that you have right now as he does about the beauty of your soul right now. And how beautiful is that incorruptible beauty that you are being forged and fashioned into and is precious in the sight of God. He says, for in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands. And so for a woman, part of your incorruptible beauty is the submission to the will of God in your life. And the submission to the will of God in your life is submission to the leadership of your husband. And so that is part of a beautiful spirit, a beautiful soul, when and you can now surrender that to the Lord as an act of worship to him. If you are not able to submit to God, you're not going to be able to submit to your husband. Because your submission to your husband is an act of worship of your submission to God. God is the one that's asking you to do that as an act of worship to him. He says that the holy women, now holy women, those are women who have been sanctified, that love God. He says they have done this in the past. That not only were they beautiful on the outside, but their soul was beautiful in its submission to the authority that God has established within a marriage relationship. He's going to use Sarah as an example. He says now that they, uh, the, for in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Now I want you to know, Abraham, he was a pretty imperfect husband. <laughs> he, if you will remember the story, he leads them into Egypt. God never wanted them to go down into Egypt. He was to stay in the land of promise and trust in God. But he goes into Egypt. Egypt is, uh, is a typology of the world. You remember that, that then Sarah gets taken into the, uh, the harem. He lies and tells everybody that this is his sister. He tells her, don't you tell anybody that I'm lying, you know? And, and so here we see that, uh, that Sarah now, Sarah submits to Abraham's poor decisions and his poor leadership. No doubt she said, Abraham, what are you doing? She talked to God. God, he is being an idiot right now. <laughs> He is lying. He's uh, taking me in on this and, and all that. But what does she do? She submits to Abraham even when he is leading poorly. 
She does not usurp his authority and become disobedient in usurping his, her, his authority. But instead, even though these are bad decisions, what she does is she just trusts God. She's like, God, okay, I'm obeying him. We are heading in a really bad direction. And this outcome, you're going to have to be the one that rescues us. And that's exactly what God does. God steps in. He protects Sarah. God steps in and rebukes Abraham. Abraham, what are you doing? And we see that he is chastised of the Lord, rebuked of the Lord. And what does that do? That helps Abraham become a better leader. He, he now forges a better relationship with God. We see that he grows as that godly leader. He grew as a godly leader not because she usurped him and made him do the right thing, but because she now did what God called her to do, which was just submit and yield to his leadership, and then I will go and correct him. And so we see here that even when things are starting to go off of the rails, we see that God calls us to stay within his working order and that he will bless it and that he will honor it. And so he says that, you are daughters of, of Abraham if you do good and that you're not afraid with any terror, not afraid to trust God. Trust God. Help your husbands to be the best leaders that they can be when they're making bad decisions, and they will. They're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. Allow God to rebuke them and to change them that they will learn and grow, and you build them up to be the leader that God is calling them to be, rather than grabbing the wheel and trying to avert a, a, a bad situation or the outcome that you do not want. When you do that, though you may avert the outcome, you have disobeyed God's plan. And so you have thwarted the growth of the leadership of your husband by doing that. Your goal is to help him become the best leader that he can possibly be. And so by usurping him or directing him or yanking the wheel uh, out of his hands, uh, you are now breaking the biblical authority that God has established within our lives. Now he turns to the husbands. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. So once again, he says to the husbands, there's no slave relationship. You two are equal in my eyes. You both uh, have full value, and I love you both. I gave you the tiebreaker vote. But you are only to use that to unlock uh, now uh, a decision that needs to be made so that you don't become relationally stuck. But here is the principle. I want you to honor her. Now, what does honor look like? Honor is when you defer to somebody. You give them their way, if at all possible. You seek to bless them and to honor them. And I find that it makes the role of a woman of submitting to his leadership so much easier when he is honoring her and when he is yielding to her. You see, the husband is to model servant leadership. He is not to be the, the despot. He is not the king with the iron scepter that rules and whatever he says and goes. That's not the model of Christianity. See, Jesus came to set that example for us. And Jesus is the model of servant leadership. He says, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. The leader that is the servant of everyone. When that husband is the servant to his wife, is honoring her, is blessing her. Remember the example that Jesus said at the Last Supper when our Lord himself stands up from the table and he goes and he performs the lowest action of a servant, which is to wash everybody's feet. He says, this is now, go and do likewise to one another. And so husbands, we have a tiebreaker vote and we have a responsibility before God, but at the same time, we are called into that servant leadership. He also tells us that we're to understand women. 
<laughs> wow, that takes a work of the Holy Spirit right, right there to understand uh, women. I want you to know that nowhere in the scriptures, and believe me, I've checked, does it ask for the women to understand the men. It, it is the men that are supposed to understand women. But here is the reality. You guys are so complex. Uh, you know, you have got hormones and you've got emotions and you've got, and God created you to be radically different than men. Even our brains are wired differently. Ladies, I want to give you an inside track, okay? When guys say, when you ask them the question, what are you thinking? And they say, nothing. I want you to know, we have that God-given ability to actually think about Nothing. <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing that we're thinking about. Women are always thinking about something. And then, and then you say to us, no, really, what are you really thinking? This is a trick question. <sighs> nothing. Just nothing. I am not thinking about anything. But now I'm thinking about not thinking about anything. And so, man, we have an amazing ability to just think about nothing. Why? Because our brains are wired differently. I want you to know that God created us differently. We are genetically engineered differently by God, even down to our brains for different physiological functions. So women, you are built to be able to conceive and, and carry a child and birth him and nurture him and nourish him through the milk of your body. I mean, amazing the, the physiology that, that God gave to you. But our brains uh, are completely different. We function different. We think differently. In the first trimester, when the gender of the child is determined within the womb, if it is a boy, testosterone shows up. And testosterone begins to do its work to now build that infant into a boy. One of the things that testosterone does is that it destroys the interconnective tissue between the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So the brain has the two lobes, the left in the right, the left is, is logic, spatial relationships, it's linear thinking. Um, this is all left brain. Right brain is creativity and art and emotion and feeling. All of this is over on the right side of the brain. So there's interconnective tissue that is between them, and testosterone starts to uh, destroy the interconnective tissue between. When a woman is born, she's got a fully connected left and right in the hemisphere of the brain. For for a boy, we have got uh, some, uh, some impairment that has happened. I'm not saying brain damage, okay? <laughs> so don't even say that. Just impairment of the left and right uh, uh, hemispheres of the, uh, of the brain. So what happens is, is that we become more compartmentalized because we are not uh, equally connected. So we learn to either gravitate to the left side or the right side. Most men gravitate over to the left side. The, the linear, the progressive, the, the logic inside. When we make decisions, we think them out. We put fact upon fact upon fact, and then we come up with our decision. When you ask a man why he thinks something, he can go over the list of the reason why, because he went linear in his decision making. Now, a woman, she's interconnected. She doesn't stay in the left side. She swirls. It's just a swirling motion here that happens. Uh, and so here's what happens is, is that in order for her to make a decision, she'll take the facts and she'll stick some facts in there and then she'll see how she feels about it. And, and, and then she'll take uh, everything else that she'll put and she'll put it all in and swirl it around and ding, out pops the answer. And now this uh, has become a, a, a very, she has made this into a sophisticated system. She has been building this from the time that she was first born. She looks for relational clues. She's watching people's faces. She is picking up information from all over, swirling it around, and then she gives you the answer. And so suddenly she will say something like, I don't like that person. And you're like, why? They're, 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 and she'll say, I don't know. I just don't like him. <laughs> Right? That's what came up. But why? I want to know the facts because look, he's a nice guy. I've known him a long time. He's been there for me in the past. And she's, I don't care about all of that. 
I'm just telling you what came out, okay? <laughs> bad apple, bad apple, bad apple, okay? And then you're like, no, look, you can't even give me one reason. Give me one reason. I can't give you a reason. Okay, and we will tend to dismiss <laughs> her answer because she isn't able to speak to us in the linear progression that we make a decision. But invariably, what happens down the road? <laughs> oh, he's a bad apple. And we're like, how did you know? And she's like, I don't know. That's what came out. Uh, and so we see here that, uh, that the way that women process and the way that men process. But I want you to know, while women have that amazing radar system that, that God gave to you guys, uh, and that is so advantageous in certain situations, there are also other situations when being able to separate yourself from emotion, to handle complex, high-pressure, instantaneous decisions that require accurate judgment and good leadership, it is amazing to not have that process being interfered with, with emotions and feelings and everything else. And so God has given us the ability as men to have this ability to separate into that left side of the brain and to think deeply upon things in a logical way a way to be able to make certain decisions. And when you couple that with the woman who's able to swirl and you put both radar systems uh, into your life, you are now using the fullness of what God created for you to be as a husband and wife. For a wife to dismiss the husband or the wife to dismiss or the husband to dismiss the wife is to not understand the way that God has built you to mutually complement one another and so it is the husband's responsibility to be able to understand the woman and to understand that God built her in a different way to value it, to honor it, to appreciate. She will pick up things that your radar is not going to pick up. And her radar is a sophisticated radar that God built to be able to aid and to help us to move forwards in our marriages and in our families. And so... Here he moves on now, he's talked to the husbands, he's talked to the wives, and then verse 8, finally, all of you, be of one mind. Have compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous. And so the, the exhortations that, it's about love. It's about loving God and loving uh, one another. And so we need to continue to grow in our capacity to love. He says, not returning evil for evil, or reviling for reviling. Jesus said if they smite you on the cheek that you're to what? Turn the other cheek. Don't return. Learn how to absorb injustice in your life. Learn how to just absorb it. Not to answer back. Not to be forcible back. When you're mistreated, learn to just absorb that. God's given you that capacity in the spirit to be able to absorb injustice. He says, but on the contrary, blessing knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. In verse 11, let him turn away from evil and do good. It's not enough that we just turn away from evil. You are called to turn away from evil. Is there any evil in your life that you need to turn away from today? Is there any evil that you're allowing a place in your life that God is asking you to turn away from that? Turning away from evil sanctification isn't the end of it, though. If you're a sanctified vessel, but you're not being used, then you're not doing anything. God wants you sanctified so you then can have his love being poured through you onto others. He wants to use you. And so uh, abstain from evil and now do good. And so there is a, a two-part direction that he gives. Seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When you're partaking of evil, know this, that the face of the Lord now is going to come against you. He is for those that are seeking his will in their life. In verse 13, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? 
He's now in the first century. When you became a Christian, you were just inviting persecution. It was going to be a hard road. And so he talks about that. He deals with that issue straight up. He says, who is he who's going to harm you if you become a follower of Jesus Christ? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. God will protect you. He says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. What that means is put him into first place, that he would have that exclusive first place in your heart and in your life. Everything else comes after the Lord first. He says, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. He says, if you're getting in trouble at work because you're showing up late and you're being sloppy and you're not getting your work done and you're in trouble for that, that's your own fault. That's, you're getting reviled because for your own evil, for your, for, for your own mistakes that you're making. But when you're doing a good job and you're loving the Lord and they do not like your faith and they do not like Christians and you're not getting promoted because you won't fudge the reports and you won't be dishonest in your expense accounts and you won't work the system that you're being told to work. He says when you suffer because of your integrity and your righteousness before God, he says know this, that you're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Suffering for righteousness Who's a model of that? Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate model of suffering for righteousness. He always did the will of the Father, walked in perfect obedience and perfect righteousness, and yet he suffered. And so when we are going to follow in his steps, we also can expect that we're going to suffer for righteousness. He says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So you remember that everybody that died in faith before Christ's crucifixion, remember that they would offer animal sacrifices. Now they offered animal sacrifices by faith because God said, that is what I want you to do. So they believed God and they did that. But the blood of animals never took away the sins off of their soul. They died in faith, but their souls still had sins on them. That's why they went to Abraham's bosom, which was that compartment in Hades, a place of comfort. But they couldn't enter into the presence of God because their souls still was stained with sin. What can take away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, and it wasn't available yet, and so they were in this place of holding. After Jesus was crucified and put into the grave, he went down, and what did he do? He washed the souls of every single person that was in Abraham's bosom. He took captivity captive, that when he ascended on high, he took now everybody that was there in heaven, I mean, that was in Abraham's bosom, took them all to heaven. Today, there's nobody in Abraham's bosom. Today, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Why? Because our souls are washed so we can enter into the presence of God without sins uh, on our soul. And so uh, he preached to the spirits that were there in prison, verse 20, who formerly were disobedient. There's none righteous. No, not one. Everyone has sinned and fallen short. He says, when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype which now saves us baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what Peter talks about now is water, how water was a, a symbol of judgment, how God took water and he judged the earth with flood. Remember that there is a rainbow now, which was God's promise that he would never judge the world again by water. So water was a typology of judgment. 
judgment. But in the new covenant, God took that symbol for judgment and he flipped it around to the exact opposite. What's the opposite of judgment is salvation. And so baptism, now water, is representative of our baptism, of our identification of salvation. So here it was judgment, but now it's an anti-type. It's baptism. Baptism is the symbol, is the typology that we're saved. He says, it's not the baptism that takes away your sins, but it is the baptism that is the proclamation to the world that you have Jesus Christ in your heart and that you have entrusted him for your salvation. So the water, which was judgment, is now a typology of our salvation. He says, who has gone into heaven, see, amen, uh, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. So Jesus has ascended. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he will rule and reign in righteousness forever and ever. Amen? Amen. amen. As we close our study, just want to draw your attention to verse 15 for a moment where he said, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you, who asks you a reason for the hope that is inside of you. He says that that there is going to come, as you live your life before the Lord, as people watch your life, as you go through trials and the ups and downs, they're going to see how you have a peace that passes understanding, how they're having troubles, but they're not okay with it. The company's going to lay off people, and the Christian's saying, praise the Lord, and whatever happens, God will, and they're like, what? <laughs> you know, that's not how I'm feeling. And, uh, and when they experience now, and they, they start to have troubles in their life, and they have watched you, they've just watched you, They've seen the joy in your life. They've seen the way that you have difficulties also, but you don't seem to be bothered by them. That when suddenly their life hits a catastrophe, and it will, the storms of life are going to come. That person that was so hard, that wanted nothing to do with you or, or your faith or your Jesus or any of that, when their life goes into crisis, Oftentimes, they will seek you out, and they will say, hey, man, my life's a mess right now. My marriage is falling apart. I don't, I don't know what to do. Or my son is in the hospital right now in, the, in an accident. I don't know mm, what to do. And, and when real life mm, hits their life, and they suddenly recognize that they're bankrupt for the answers in those real-life situations, they come with, with a heart that's been cracked open in their life, and they're going to ask about the hope that you have, about the difference and in, in what's going on in your life. And here what Peter says is that those are divine appointments. God is going to create these divine appointments. And the question is this, when those divine appointments happen, are you ready to be able to just minister to them, to share with them, to pray with them, to point them to the Lord? Well, the problem is you never know when those appointments are, <laughs> are going to happen, the God appointments. And so Peter says, since you don't know, and God doesn't send you a resume in advance, an itinerary of when those appointments are going to happen, therefore be ready when? Always. Be ready always. Be ready for anybody whose life gets cracked open and presents you with an opportunity to be able to share the reason. He says, when they ask when they ask so different than trying to force yourself on others is to live out your faith and the living out of your faith when their lives hit those bumps they're going to come and they're going to ask and here it says just be ready be able to love people be ready to love people and to give them a reason for the hope that you have in your life let's pray father thank you for your word God, we thank you that you are the unchanging God, that you are the one that has, uh, has organized this world and has organized our lives. You have declared what is right and what is wrong, and, and your morals are unchanging. And Lord, regardless of how man tries to redefine right and wrong, you are unchanging. You are the one that created us male and female, distinct and unique. You do not want the men to be women. You don't want women to be men. You want men to be men and women to be women. 
You're the ones who, you're the one who identify with God and created the covenant of marriage. One man, one woman, holy covenant, body, soul, and spirit, and connected together in a mystery and a oneness. God, help us in our marriages to experience that. God, you are the one that established the sanctity of life that you are the one that knits together in babies in a mother's womb. And so, Lord, we pray that in a world that is seeking to redefine when life exists, that, that they would recognize and understand that you're the author of life. God, we ask that you would continue to help us to understand the way that you've organized marriages and, and the headship is not a, a despot, but as a servant leader. And Father, that you have instructed children to honor and obey and to, uh, and to be in that direct line of authority to their parents. And so, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your word, the blueprint for our life, for every area of our life. Help us, God, to receive it and by faith to stand upon it, to trust it with our whole heart. Help us to not be swayed by the newest fad, the opinion of the world, but let us build our lives upon the unchanging rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ, and the word of God, the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. Bless us and help us to love you, God, and to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.